I take four as opposed to just say one is that I really want to make sure I have a, a space excavated as quickly as possible. Uh, the primary limiter early on in your fortress is going to be how quickly you can excavate the necessary space in which to set up. While you can build a palisade around your fortress, uh, if you're planning to dig out multiple rooms, or you're going to build, as I will, a pancake, a pancake stack design, then you're going to want to be able to excavate that space quickly in order to get it sized up and functional fairly quickly. Uh, in addition to those four miners, I will also bring a carpenter, and this guy I will give all the skill he can take, which is just proficient, that's five levels. You can't raise any skills beyond five, you can only take him up to five. You can give them multiple skills, I can give, make this guy a carpenter and a mason if I liked, but you can't give them more than ten total skill levels, and I want our carpenter to be doing mostly carpentry, so he's not going to have a secondary skill. This next guy we'll make into a mason. And this final guy we'll make into a weaponsmith and a grower. And he'll be doing our early on construction for our tools and weapons, as well as becoming our primary farmer once we get to that point. Nope, I don't look at the dwarves' stats whatsoever, and there's a reason. Uh, while stats do have an impact, so let's talk about that for a moment, uh, each of these dwarves is uh, a little different, technically. I can hit view and I can get all sorts of information about them and what their dreams and, you know, <laughs> what their dreams are, what they like and don't like, and their stats. So great kinesthetic sense, iron will, amazing spatial sense. This determines what they're really best at to start. If you're wanting to assign skills to your dwarves based on what they are good at uh, from the get-go, then you probably want to come in here and look at those and go out on the wiki and figure out what each skill is actually, you know, tied to so that you know whether spatial sense affects mining or hunting or wood cutting, and then assign them their skills appropriately. Uh, got some folks asking why I don't take these, why I don't take the, some of these other things. So let me back out here for a second. Let's let's run down the list of people are asking about appraisal. I don't take appraisal. Uh, I won't need appraisal because frankly, we're either going to seize or just simply buy out the first caravan anyway. We won't need it. Uh, you will build appraisal skill incredibly quickly if you have a large number of items uh, in the depot for trading on the first time. So if you trade. If you trade in rock crafts like mugs and cups and instruments, for example, uh, and you jam hundreds of them into your depot in that first first trading session, your guy will get appraisal skill the moment you open the trade window, basically. Uh, you won't need to bring it with you. And that's one more skill you don't have to take. One more embark point you can, you know, more embark points you can save for items. Uh, people were asking, you know, what about some of the other things like brewing or woodcutting? Uh, dwarves can do every job in the game, every job, everything, from the get-go. Uh, they can't necessarily do them uh, to the peak of performance, but they can do every job. So all of my guys who I've given mining skill to will be pretty much as effective as every other dwarf that has that skill. Skill is the first and foremost determinant of how good a dwarf can do at a given job. Discipline I have to touch on. That's the one thing I forgot to add. So this is the setting I would have, this is exactly what I would have taken in uh, version 3411. In the new version, I'm going to drop Weaponsmith on by one setting, and all of my dwarves will take one level of the discipline skill. Let me find it here. There it is, discipline. Discipline is part of the new morale system, and it's kind of a little bit busted. It doesn't work real well. Bummer, bummer, bummer. Uh, basically, it determines whether dwarves will run in terror at the slightest little thing or not. And the folks who have no discipline break and run if they so much as see a cockroach. Whereas folks with at least some discipline, um, they work pretty good. So, brewing. Every dwarf can brew. Uh, later on, we'll be having brewing done in parallel rather than in series, so I don't really care too much to have a really highly skilled brewer. Uh, engraving is something you can skill up on the fly by just having whoever you're planning to do it smooth your entire fortress single-handedly. He will happily build up his engraving skill quite quickly, 
And yeah, your brewer will basically gain brewing skill almost immediately and go right into brewing. A lot of these skills don't get a quality benefit so much as they get a speed benefit. Um, your woodcutters cut wood faster. Your masons get better quality results. Which skills are quality based and which skills are uh, speed based, purely speed based, uh, is out on the wiki. Uh, most of these skills that are speed based, I tend to pr tend to not worry about too much of them. From draining my river, what do you mean? Well, to be honest, my dwarves won't spend much time drinking water. Uh, we'll be bringing booze with us to start, and we'll get a brewer underway fairly quickly, and we will brew booze. Um, we just won't have a dedicated brewer to start. Um, if your river is actually disappearing, then it's possible you're doing something to drain it, or it's possible you've run into something where there's a bug that you've found. Normally, your river shouldn't actually disappear. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember if this was a hot climate or not, so I'd have to go back and look. The hot climate could could explain the river if it's really hot. Wine does not get better over time. Did you change your temperature settings when you uh, generated your world? Too high a temperature could vaporize your river. Basically evaporate it up. Alright, now in addition to skills, we also have to determine what items we want our dwarves to bring with them. Now when you tab over, I'm actually, my cursor is actually over there on the left side of the screen. If I push to the right, I can, you can see it. I'm over here on the right now. And if I go back to the left, it's over on the left. But there's no items on the left, so we have to add them. Uh, the first item you always add, always, always, always add an anvil. No anvil, no metalworking. And if at all possible, bring the iron anvil. There's no benefit to bringing a steel anvil. It costs three times as much, and you don't need to. In addition to the iron anvil, we'll be bringing various types of stone with us. In particular, if I can, I bring malachite, I bring cassiterite, and I bring coal. Specifically, bituminous coal. And then we'll bring ten of each of those. Now we'll use the malachite and the cassiterite to make bronze, because malachite is an ore of copper and cassiterite is an ore of tin, and we'll use the coal to fuel the reaction, i.e. to power the smelters and the forges. All right, now in addition to that, let's see, we'll bring some fish, so our dwarves have something to eat. And I'm bringing different kinds of fish, and I'll explain why here in just a moment. And the first thing I do is I bring one of every type of fish I can find. And the reason is because pond turtles will get assigned to one barrel, and cave fish will get assigned to another barrel, and cave lobsters will get assigned to another barrel, and lungfish will get a barrel of their own as well. And what will happen is, is I will get five, or five, four, four barrels, four barrels instead of one. If I only brought pond turtles, I would get a number of barrels equal to the number of pond turtles I have divided by ten rounded up. So if I had 50 pond turtles, I'd get five barrels. But if I have 50, if I have 49 pond turtles and one cave lobster, I'll get six barrels because I'll get five barrels of cave, of pond turtles because the nine left over will go into a barrel just fine. And then I'll get an extra barrel for the cave lobster. And once the lobster's been eaten, the barrel is empty and can be used. 
And yeah, it's not really a big deal now, but I'm showing you how to think about your Embark points. And another example we'll be doing that with is sand, because sand is cheaper than bags. Now, let's see, that gives us food. We're also going to want to make sure we bring drinks. Now, again, I bring one of each type of drink. And part of the reason for this is, is I don't go into crafting containers early. Uh, early on, we'll, we'll be subsist quite nicely on the free barrels we get without having to make more. Uh, that will allow us quite nicely to uh, avoid having to go into rock crafting right off the bat. Oops, I don't want dwarven wine. We'll be producing plenty of Dwarven wine. We won't need to bring any with us. Let's do Dwarven rum instead. Um, this will be our initial st stock of food for our dwarves to consume. So we'll have 40 units of pond turtle, a few miscellaneous fish units, and 60 units of rum with some miscellaneous drink units. And yeah, we'll don't worry. We'll get to the stone chugs, believe me. We'll be having rock pots more than you'll ever want to imagine. But this prevents us from having to think about them early on, and I find it useful, especially since you're not guaranteed to get a large migration wave in the first wave or two, to limit the amount of jobs I'm going to actually ask my dwarves to do. I, especially early in your fortress's life, the number of dwarves you have is your primary limitation on what you can get done. All right, so we've got our food and our drink and our materials for our forging. Uh, we will bring some wood. Not much, just a little. We'll have plenty of wood when we get to where we're going. But I do want to bring some because it makes it easier for us to get started. Uh, once we start cutting trees, we'll have more wood than we know what to do with. Uh, if you embark in an area like a desert or a glacier that doesn't have access to wood, I strongly, strongly recommend uh, you bring more because you're going to need it. Wood is the only material your dwarves can make beds from. There's no such thing as a stone bed unless you get lucky. Uh, and if you want your dwarves to be able to sleep somewhere other than a cave floor, that means you're going to need access to logs. You can trade for anything you can bring, so there's no, it's not like if you don't bring the logs you won't ever have them, but you are limited by what they bring to you at that point. Okay, so we've got our logs. Let's get some stone. I like gabbro, personally. Just random choice. I bring a few gabbro rocks with me so I have something to build my initial forges out of. Uh, we'll want to bring seeds, because with no seeds we can't do any planting. So we'll bring one of every type of seed that we want to plant underground. So these are all our underground crops here we're going to take with us here. Plump helmets are the primary crop in your fortress, uh, generally speaking. They grow up faster than other crops, and they can be grown in all seasons. They're edible raw, meaning you don't have to have them cooked or processed before your dwarves can actually consume them, and they can be brewed into booze. So these are a primary staple foodstuff for your dwarves. Pigtails are used for cloth as well as for booze, and we'll be moving into cloth production fairly quickly. Uh, cave wheat, I'm only going to bring one of. We probably won't plant much cave wheat. It can be brewed into booze or ground up into flour. Um, but it interferes with the growing season of pigtails, and I am more concerned about my cloth than I am about my flour, and I can brew pigtails into booze if I need to. So cave wheat doesn't have a whole lot to recommend it. Sweet pods grow in a different season than some of the other crops, so it's nice to have some of them. And rock nuts are used for quarry bushes, which are easily the uh, most profitable, broadest quantity. These things produce meals like you would not believe. Yeah, no beer. So somebody asked, well, couldn't you get an extra barrel if I took 61 units? Yes, if you do that right there, you get one extra barrel. That's correct, because it's two. And I would have the same number of barrels with 61 that I would have with 69, but the moment I go to 70, I go to another barrel. So if you want to maximize, really maximize your extra barrels, you need to bring that extra unit. Um, I'm not that concerned about it, really. Some extra barrels, not an infinite supply. <laughs> 
So our fortress is sadly going to be lacking in beer. Our dwarves are going to have to make do with ales. Okay, we've got our seeds, we've got our food. Let's see what else we got here. Got our anvils. We're going to want sand. What type of sand is irrelevant? White sand, yellow sand, red sand, it's all the same. Uh, bring a few bags. These come, sand comes in bags. And the reason we're bringing sand, even if we don't plan to have a glass working industry, is because the sand is contained in a bag and we can dump the sand out later and keep the bag. So bags cost 10 embark points, sand costs 1. So I get 10 times as many bags bringing sand than if I brought the bags themselves. Most of the things you can bring with you aren't things you're really going to care about, or they are things that you will better off you'd be better off if you can produce them on site. Um, let's talk about weapons for a minute, because one of the things you could bring with you are weapons. You know, actual say picks for digging. So I could bring a copper pick. Actually, I could bring a bronze pick. Now let's let's talk about bronze because that's what we're going to end up with. Bronze picks individually, one pick costs 110 embark points. Okay. It's not particularly high quality. It's just a standard bronze pick. We're going to bring bronze. Now, we're not bringing bronze as bronze. We're bringing bronze as ore. So we will bring a unit of malachite, a unit of cassiterite, and a unit of coal. And when properly processed, these 12 units of ore and three units worth of coal, okay, so just one of each of these, will produce a huge ton of bronze for us. We don't need to bring bronze picks. We'll make our own bronze, and we'll end up with more this way than we would if we brought the finished goods. Generally speaking, you are always going to be better off if you bring the raw materials than if you bring the finished goods. Uh, exceptions would be containers, which are valuable in their own right. Uh, you're better off to bring a log and make it into a wooden training axe than to bring wooden training axe. Your carpenter will get the additional skill. And you'll get a higher quality training axe when you're done. And you can bring more logs than you could training axes. Because one training axe costs like 17 points and a log costs three. So you can bring five logs and make five training axes instead of bringing one. Now the exception to that would be is if you're embarking somewhere that may be hostile. Uh, if you're going to embark somewhere like terrifying glacier right next to a tower you might want to think about bringing armor and weapons because you're probably going to need them right away. And you may not have time to actually make them for yourself. We're embarking in an area that's a little more benign than that. We'll have time to actually get uh, a fledgling metalworking industry up and build some bronze items for ourselves fairly early on. Now, in addition to the sand, which we bring for just for the bags, basically, even if we're not actually going to have... Uh, a glass working industry. We're going to go down through here and we'll get uh, yarn, thread, and in particular we'll get cave spider silk thread and we'll bring a couple of units of that. And the reason is because I want to have access to silk early on. We'll trade for a lot of our silk fairly quickly. I don't want to deconstruct the wagon to make my first axes because it spreads my stuff out all over the ground and I want to keep things fairly neat. So we're skipping the deconstruct the wagon, build carpenter, make axe, cut trees method. And if you find wooden axes or sand for bags feeling like cheating, knock yourself out. But there's no way to bring the sand and pay full price for the bag unless you pay more than you would otherwise. So I'd have to pay 11 points and get two bags is the only way I could bring any sand with me. And you have plenty of embark points. As with all things in Dwarf Fortress, if you don't like it the way I'm doing it, don't do it this way. If you're going to minimize your number of free items, you're going to want to make sure that you bring 10 of every booze, 10 of every fish that you take, or 10 of every meat that you take, and that you minimize the number of excess types you get. So these extra lung fish that get their own barrel, you'd get rid of them and you'd add two more pond journals. And that will cut down on the number of free containers you get. 
frankly, I've always found it a little bizarre that if you're going to set up a settlement, you only send them with one la one wagon load of goods, but that's the way Dwarf Fortress does it, so we'll just make do. This basic setup, food, ore, yarn, silk, seeds, and drinks, is pretty much everything. This is everything I would need to bring in terms of raw materials. Now, I do want to bring some animals. We'll use dogs to uh, defend our fortress. We'll take one male and five females because, as every guy's fantasy will tell you, it only takes one guy. Uh, we'll bring a pair of cats. We'll, let's see, go down here and we'll bring sheep. And we'll go all the way down to the bottom and we'll bring some turkeys for eggs and meat and leather. Turkeys are fantastic for that stuff. All right. So let's see. What are we forgetting here? Because I've got a lot of points left over still. What have I forgotten? Oh, that's right. Normally I would be taking a whole lot more wood. But with the changes to the trees, I don't need to. <laughs> I freed a whole ton of embark points there. A lot of these things are pretty much junk. There's no reason to bring an iron puzzle box. It has no value except for trade goods. And yeah, depending on what you take with you will kind of determine how early on you're going to have to deal with various things. If you bring an, a surplus of food, you may not have to deal with food, food at all early on. Uh, since I've got so many embark points, we're going to take a unit of charcoal with us. Uh, That'll pretty well get us set, I think. So we've got a bunch of embark points left over. Let's take some extra sheep. Get our wool industry started a little earlier than we might otherwise. And we'll take some turkeys to make up those extra points. And the four we've got left over, we'll just throw that into pigtail seeds, because why not? Okay, there we go. Now for the most crucial decision ever. The absolute most crucial decision you will ever make. You must name your fortress. You can hit random, and that's usually what I do. Just random through something until you get something you think you like, or hit random until you get something and we're done. And I'll hit random a few times, and while I'm looking away from the screen, I'll stop, and it looks like we're going to be steak-seared tonight. And we are the Fleshy Helm. And a more penile reference I'm not sure we could have found. Awesome. So, let's see. Uh, wheelbarrows can be made... Oh, I rarely name my fortresses specifically. I just typically hit random a few times. Just, I want to see what I'm getting before I do. If it's particularly silly, I might not use it. Uh, before we actually embark, we want to make sure we save our profile. By saving the profile... By saving the profile, you can call it back up later for our uh, use. And that's pretty much it. Uh, pick out your stuff, pick out your animals, pick out your skills. That's an embark in a nutshell. If you want to absolutely hyper-maximize your dwarves, you'll want to make sure that you line their skills up with things that they're actually good at. From my standpoint, I care that they get the jobs done, not necessarily that they're doing something that they felt like they were destined to do from childhood. Your mileage may vary. And all of these things that I've kind of glossed over are either covered on the wiki or are fairly self-explanatory in terms of what you're bringing. Uh, we're bringing... Materials for bronze, we're bringing food so our dwarves have something to eat while they're working on other things. We're bringing booze so they have booze to drink while they're working on other things. We're bringing a few logs just to get started, a few stone just to get started, seeds for our first for our first farms, sand for the bags and for early glass working, um, cave spider silk so we'll have access to it before we get to the caverns in case we don't get there before our first mood and they beg for silk. And one unit of charcoal because I had the extra points and I don't want to burn a log to make charcoal if I can just bring charcoal. It's not exactly the most points efficient thing, but it works great.
Now, the name of your fortress is kind of a personal decision, and you can find that, for example, uh, some of the famous fortresses of yesteryear have names that people recognize. For example, Oil Furnace is a fortress that's actually had its own its history told in pictures out there on the web. If you Google Oil Furnace, all one word, you will no doubt be linked to a talented artist who has illustrated some of his Dwarf Fortress fortresses, histories, as he played the game. A lot of my viewers are commenting that they either take random names or they've got one that they make for themselves. Uh, in the past, I've actually used a, a fixed name for my Dwarven's uh, group. Now, this group isn't your actual civilization. This group is just your offshoot, your the, the dwarves that belong to the group that makes your fortress. So the Fleshy Helm is not actually our civilization. It's just our fortress uh, club, if you will. And now we'll go ahead and embark. And you may notice a significant hesitation uh, when it kind of kicks in. Don't skip past this uh, first page. You can actually see at least one threat here. It'll tell you that some animal type, for example, will get hungry. This might be polar bears if you were in a glacier. It could be giant tigers if you're in a savage terrain. Now, once we go on past that, we'll actually be into fortress mode. And I know we've taken a long time to get here, and I thank you for your patience as we kind of walk through the most basic steps to get into the game itself. Alright, so let's talk about what we're seeing here. Okay, this is a thumbnail of our entire Embark site. Okay, and this X is kind of where we are. And this is a list of the keys, the hot keys, that are necessary to navigate through all the menu or to open up all the different menus. So, now, I'm not going to list every one of these hot keys as I press them. I will kind of tell you what I'm doing as I do it. But if you need these hot keys or you want to see the overall minimap, tab allows you to show or hide these various trays. Typically speaking, I will be playing without them. If you hit tab a few times, right there is the hot keys and... You can look at anything I want to do. If I say I'm working with a zone, open up the hotkeys and look for the hotkey for zones. If I'm setting up a hauling route, you know, there you go, there's hauling. If I'm creating a stockpile, there's stockpiles. All of these settings are available to you. The, the keys are visible. Uh, I won't probably mention them each as I go after the first time. So bear with me. If you're watching at home, you can pause. And if you have questions and you're in the audience and you want to know what I'm hitting, just ask. Okay, now, we'll move through levels here as we go up. So this is the surface, and then we'll go up as though we're leaving the surface and taking off into orbit. And we'll go up the trees, and you can kind of see the tree branches as we go higher, all the way up through, and then the tips of the trees as they kind of fade out, and now we're up into the open sky. Over at the top right, you're going to see a number. This is plus 14. This is, we are 14 levels above ground level. Z level, 150. As I go down, you'll see that that number decreases, and we're getting closer and closer to the surface, and our Z level gets closer and closer and closer and closer, and now we're at the surface again. The level below the surface here has roots, that's these big brown patches here, and ponds. This is the actual water of the pond. So this is the surface of the pond. This is actually a submerged level in the pond, if you will. And a bunch of unexplored soil that we haven't ever dug out or seen, so we don't know what's in this space here. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be solid soil, but we don't know what type. So here you can see the kind of soil differs. This is sand, and this is maybe silty clay, for example. If I hit K, I can actually pull up what is in each square. So this is silty clay, and this is yellow sand. And these are pecan tree roots, and this is a pond of stagnant water that's seven units deep. Stagnant water is seven of seven. A murky pool slope. Now what that means to you, before we actually actually even unpause the game, is this is the area we're in. I can actually zoom all the way out. This is the region we're embarked in. Okay? The whole thing. I know it gets kind of crushed here. All right? here's our wagon. These are ponds. Here's our brook. And off to the southwest, there's kind of a hill that's one, one level high, because it only goes up one level. So we have kind of a single level hill right there. And then below ground, we quickly get into the fog of war, where we haven't explored any of this thing. 
So all the way down through the world, all the way down to the bottom is completely unexplored and we don't know where anything is. Okay? As our dwarves excavate the surface, ex excavate, we will find terrain features, veins of metal, clusters of ores, layers of flux stone, different types of stones, all the way down through. We'll find magma, we'll find caverns, and we'll find it all pretty much at random as we go. Now, I'm going to zoom back in because, frankly, I can't play at that, that level of zoom. It would drive me absolutely nuts. And you can see here our dwarves. Here's a miner, some turkeys. Here's our cat and our dogs. Uh, here's our sheep. Uh, we also have a few draft animals that came with us. Images for everything because I'm not playing with ASCII. The brackets are zoom in and zoom out by default in the starter pack. The up and down through the Z levels is the greater than, less than sign. The mouse wheel can be used to zoom up and down through the levels, just like the up or the greater than, less than. In fact, it's faster if you're changing a whole lot of levels and know where you're going to use the mouse wheel. Uh, if you tab, I hit K, excuse me, and I... Oh, doesn't look like mouse query is enabled. That must be from DF Hack, so we don't have mouse query. That's all right. Play without that just fine. Now we have all these trees around us. This is a tree trunk right here. Tree trunk, tree trunk, big tree trunk. So that's probably a bigger tree. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's just the weirdest looking tree I've seen in a long time. Great big fat trunk. Little bitty tiny branches. Hilarious. Hilarious. Awesome. We're going to want to cut those. They'll drop logs, and we'll want to make sure that they don't grow in areas we don't want them because they'll have branches fall and punch holes in our roof. We don't want that. So we'll have to excavate an area of tree or, you know, carve out an area of trees in the middle of this forest. And then we'll wall it off and make sure that nothing grows inside it where we don't want it and that nothing grows too close to our walls. Alternatively, we could actually dig into this soil layer here. But again, we'd have to make sure that tree branches didn't fall from above and punch holes into our fortress. So we end up with the same problem either way. You can avoid that problem with uh, deserts, mountains, glaciers, and so on. The first thing we'll do is we'll designate with the D key. The designate menu allows you to mark terrain for various terraforming options. Uh, we'll mark area for tree cutting, and we're not going to mark a huge area, just a little area. We don't want to cut everything, just a big, just this chunk right around our area here. Now, right now, they won't, they can't actually cut that tree for two reasons. The first is we don't actually have any axes. I didn't bring any axes. We need an axe to cut a tree. That's one. The second is none of our dwarves have the wood cutting labor. It's time we talked about dwarf therapist. Dwarf therapist is a memory utility. It will read the Dwarf Fortress memory state and report what it finds. So when we connect to Dwarf Fortress, it will read our dwarves, and we have a carpenter, a mason, four miners, and a planter. And over here in the middle, you'll see a boxed list of all the labors in Dwarf Fortress. These are the jobs your dwarves can do. For example, pot ash making determines whether a dwarf can work to make pot ash. And if I turn that on and I commit that change, our carpenter can now make potash. If I turn it off, he can't. Now this isn't his ability to make potash, he may, he's always able to make potash. This is whether he's allowed to make potash. Yeah, that little chunk is going to be a whole lot of logs. Compared to, in version 34 that would have been about 20 logs. In version 40 it's going to be about 500. Uh, it'll be more than enough to supply our fortress's wood needs for some time to come. And the main reason we're cutting them is we want to get rid of them, but the wood will be enough to keep us for a very long time. Now, we use labors to control what dwarves do. Uh, we have miners, but we don't have any picks, so they can't actually do mining. So the first thing I do is I make them woodcutters. And all I do is hit the woodcutting labor and hit commit, bang, done. All my miners are now set up to do woodcutting. Presto. Our mason is also going to do our furnace operating. And everybody else is right where I want them for the time being. Our carpenter is going to make stuff out of wood. Our miners are going to cut trees. Our mason is going to burn stuff and make ores that our, our planter will use to make tools. And so we have a production chain built right here that will produce picks and axes and trap components.
no idea if potash is the correct pronunciation. Blame it on my ignorance. I'd have to look it up. For those of you wondering, it's used as a fertilizer. Okay. This gets everybody doing the things I need with one exception. And this is the big gotcha to starting up the way I do. Nobody has the architecture labor. And I don't care who architects my buildings at this point. Everybody can do it as long as somebody does it. So I turn architecture on for everyone. Now we go back over to Dwarf Fortress. And we'll set up some buildings. First we'll build, build, B, a carpet, a workshop, W. That's a capital or a C for Carpenter's Workshop. And the Carpenter's Workshop we'll build over here right next to the wagon. We'll make it out of wooden logs because we don't care what it's made out of. We also need to build a Metalsmith's Forge. We'll build that right next to the Carpenter's Workshop. It needs an anvil. It must have a stone item of some kind. We'll use the Gabbro. And then we'll hit Escape and we'll go to E for Smelters and we'll get a regular Smelter. And we'll put it next to the Metalsmith's Shop and we'll build it out of Gabbro as well. Okay. Now what I've just done is I've built, or designated, I should say, three workshops. Dwarves haven't actually built them yet, so that workshop isn't functioning. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. And if I use Q for the query tool, I can actually query that workshop, and you can see my carpenter's workshop is still waiting for construction. It needs a carpenter to work on it, and nobody is building it currently. That's because we're still paused, and we haven't actually told our carpenter to get started. Likewise, we need metal smithing for the metalsmith's forge and architecture for the smelter. So this, those are the three buildings we're going to build. And those three labors have to be enabled on at least one dwarf who has nothing else to do in order for those jobs to be done. So... Now that we've got our, our tree cutting area designated, we've got our wood shop, or our workshops designated. This is everything we need to actually unpause the game. But there's a few menus I do want to pay special attention to before we get started. First off, the orders menu, O. We'll go in here and we'll talk about a few things. Uh, workshop orders, W, capital W first. I will only auto loom dyed thread. This keeps your dwarves from automatically weaving all the thread in your fortress into cloth. Thread has its own uses, separate from actual bolts of cloth, and you will want to retain some, some thread for your hospital, for example. Uh, you can manually uh, loom any thread you like. This is just what your dwarves will automatically do. Likewise, I will allow my dwarves to use dyed cloth by default, normally. Any cloth will allow them to use any cloth. That's so when they make clothing, they'll use dyed cloth. This increases the value of the cloth. Doesn't have a whole lot of other effect, really. Auto collect webs I turn off. I don't want my dwarves wandering out in the caverns to find cave spider silk. Uh Auto slaughter, auto butcher, auto fishery, auto kitchen, and auto tan I leave on. Uh, these basically automatically add to certain workshops various types of jobs when they are called for. So, for example, if I mark an animal for butchering, the auto butchery tells the butcher's workshop to automatically queue up a job to butcher that animal. So not, not only do I tell it to do it, it actually gets set up in the workshop to be done. Uh, the only auto job I turn off is the auto collect. That's just because I don't want my my dwarves going someplace I don't want them to necessarily be. And that takes care of workshop orders. Uh, we'll touch on activity zone orders a little later. Uh, I only want zone fishing, and later on I'll only want zone drinking. Uh, if my dwarves have to consume water, currently they'll consume it from anywhere. Later on, if they have to consume water, I want them to do it from my well. Someone has commented in my thread how Dwarf Fortress players all go to a Wikipedia article as soon as a question pops up, and the answer is, yes, they do. They're well-trained. Uh, Dwarf Fortress Wiki is 
without a doubt, an absolutely, positively indispensable resource that every Dwarf Fortress player owes it to themselves to be familiar with. Now, other than the orders we've set in the Workshop Orders and Activity Zone menu, there's a few other things here you need to be aware of. The Harvest option right there, the H. Uh, only farmers should do your harvesting whenever possible. Uh, this means that somebody who doesn't have the farming labor set won't harvest crops. The reason you want your farmers doing the harvesting is that that's what makes them better at farming. And you want them to get better at farming because they plant more crops that way. So if you allow everyone to harvest, then you're going to dilute the skill pool for your harvesters, and your farmers will experience slower skill growth. The downside to allowing only farmers to harvest is... When the crops come after a forgotten beast invasion has killed all your farmers, nobody will actually pick the crops because you told them not to, and dwarves do not break the rules. So, when you set this rule, you need to be aware this means only your farmers do your harvesting. It means literally that. So you are creating a potential problem if you have no farmers. However, I'm guessing if you have no farmers, you probably have bigger problems, so this is a relatively minor thing. Now, we also need to change some refuse orders. That's in the refuse menu, R. We want to make sure our dwarves will collect refuse from outside. I don't care about vermin remains, but I do care about hunted kills, and that's treated as refuse. So if my dwarves go out and hunt down a deer, I want to make sure they bring it back, and that means they have to be able to gather the refuse from outside. I don't allow them to keep the skulls and other. So those are two options down there at the bottom. I need to zoom in just a little bit because it's too hard to see. Um, I don't allow other. Other is junk items that nobody cares about. And skulls are practical of practical value only as totems, which are useful only as trade goods. They're not particularly valuable by themselves. You have to encrust them with gems and other things. And it's just one more micromanaging task I can eliminate if I don't care about the loss of trade value. When your farmers get better... You can make totems from the skulls, but totems have only one point in Vanilla Dwarf Fortress, and that is to get sold. And I'm going to make mugs, or goblets, and that means I have one trade item to worry about instead of two. And if your farmers get better, you will get more crops from a planting cycle, basically. Um, Low-skill farmers will tend to come back with one one plant per seed, whereas high-skill farmers will tend to come back more with five plants per seed. And those stack sizes multiply. So you, know, you, you harvest, you plant one plump helmet seed, you get five plump helmets. You brew those five plump helmets into 25 units of booze, and so on and so forth. Coins work. Uh, We'll discuss coins in particular once we get down to melting. All crops work this way. So any crop you're planting in your farms works the same way. The better your farmers are, the better your yields are. That's how it works. I bring a skilled farmer because getting a reasonable yield right off the bat means I can start planting and get crops to support my dwarves fairly early on. If I don't have a skilled farmer, if I don't have anybody skilled in food production, I do have to run into some issues with... How am I going to produce food for my dwarves? A low-skilled hunter doesn't bring back food very often. Uh, by default, let's let's talk about that for a second. Let, let me get to that in a minute. Uh, I leave all of these other things on. If you turn them off, your dwarves will stop doing certain jobs. So, for example, the dwarves gather wood option. If I turn that on and ignore, my dwarves won't pick wood up from the surface and bring it into the fortress for my carpenter. They'll leave it right where it sits. And they'll leave it there permanently. They'll never touch it. This basically tells their dwarves all wood is off limits. You can also do the same thing with minerals. That's stones and ores, furniture, bodies, and so forth. Now, this is where we start talking about Dwarf Fortress gotchas. In the Forbid menu are various things that occur that your dwarves will reclaim without you having to provide any input. Now what this means is an item that's forbidden, your dwarves will not touch. It's taboo. So for example, that first option, forbid used ammunition, says when a dwarf shoots a bolt and it lands on the ground and doesn't break, that item is automatically forbidden. Your dwarves will never touch it again 
unless you tell them to manually. This prevents random dwarves from wandering out of your fortress to pick up crossbow bolts all over the surface. Now, similar problems exist with all of these other categories. Claiming your dead, claiming your death items, claiming other dead, and so forth. Basically, you'll end up with a situation where if you're claiming your dead and you have coffins in which you can bury some dwarves, somebody dies on the surface, a dwarf will come running out to pick up the corpse to try to bring it back. And the problem you immediately run into is that if somebody died on the surface, whatever killed them is probably still there. So your random dwarf comes running out of the fortress, runs right smack into the same problem, and now he's dead and you've got two guys coming to bury corpses. So two more dwarves leave the fortress. And this occurs with items, i.e. your dwarves drop their clothing, somebody comes to pick the clothing up, take it back to a stockpile. You don't want that to happen if somebody died. Other non-hunted dead is basically goblin corpses and uh, troll corpses. And other death items are the things those goblins were carrying. And all of these things present lures, basically, for your dwarves. So by default, you can set these to be forbidden, and your dwarves will ignore them. If you have them set to claim, your dwarves will come out to pick them up. You can always reclaim them manually. So we will have to reclaim anything that gets dropped because of a death, or because it's used up, manually. Oh yeah, they'll they'll run they'll run smack at a forgotten beast or a goblin siege to pick up a sock. Oh yeah, happened before. Happened all the time. Happens routinely if you don't forbid them. What we'll do is we'll make sure there's no siege around, and then we'll clean up the siege while our military stands watch. And that will allow us to get our, our to expose our uh, civilian dwarves to as little risk as possible. Okay, and that's pretty much it for the orders menu. I don't normally need to touch anything else. Keep in mind, if you change settings in here, this is global behavior for everything, and everything will supersede be superseded by this. Okay, now. So, now let's talk about the general menu. That's Z. Okay? Now, there are tabs, basically, up here at the top. Animals, kitchen, stone, stocks, up here at the top. And these are categories of various things. Animals lists all the animals in my fortress. Kitchen lists various um, uh, food materials that can be prepared into food. Uh, stone lists the uses for various types of stones. Oops. And stocks lists the number of every, every item in my fortress. Everything is counted, everything is enumerated, everything is accounted for. Uh, we have three units of thread in our fortress. If I hit tab, it will actually let me pick out an individual unit of thread and then zoom directly to where it is located. It's in our wagon because we haven't taken anything out. Okay. Now, other items exist in those menus that you can't see yet. We don't have a health screen because we've never appointed a doctor. Uh, we don't have a justice screen because we don't have anything assigned for justice, i.e. cages and jails and chains. Um, it lists the general amounts of items. So, for example, we know we have roughly 50 to 60 fish, but we're not sure exactly how many. Because we don't have a record keeper to keep records for our fortress. We know we have roughly 70 to 80 seeds. We're not sure exactly how many. Our record keeper doesn't, you know, tell us. Population of your dwarves and general categories into which they may fall. You will find that my dwarves kind of straddle some of these in some cases. Uh, broker will tell you how much you've traded with other civilizations and how much wealth and money you've created in your fortress. Creating money brings invasions, invasions bring fun. So, we will create wealth when we're ready, and we'll be ready by being ready for the fun we're going to have. We've got all of our workshops designated. We've... oh, let's talk about the kitchen menu. Somebody was asking about that. In the kitchen menu, you determine what dwarves are permitted to cook into meals. By default, all of these things 
are set one way or the other. Now, normally you don't want them to cook seeds. That means you use your seeds up not for planting, but actually just for cooking. And a seed doesn't get planted into five plants, it just gets cooked into one seed meal. So you don't really want to use your seeds for cooking. Booze can be used in addition to solid ingredients. Uh, richer meals require more ingredients, so you'll have pond turtles and rum if you're making stews. Uh, you might have pond turtles, rum, uh, cave fish, and cave lobster if you're having roasts, and so forth. We'll discuss the kitchen in more detail later, but for now, we won't touch the booze cooking settings. We'll leave them right where they are. You'll want to make sure that things you don't want to be cooked aren't cooked, and you'll want to make sure that things that you want to be cooked are being cooked. By default, most things are permitted for cooking. Seeds are the exception. Oh, let's talk levels. Uh, food and drinks. Uh, I may be mistaken, it's been a while since I looked it up, but as I recall, it requires two meals per dwarf per month and requires four booze per dwarf per month. One per week, basically. Dwarves basically drink a unit. So, seven dwarves, you'd think that's a long time, but we'll go through 21 dwarf weeks per week. Or, or uh, excuse me, we'll go through 28 dwarf weeks, or dwarf units per month, so by the time we get to our third month, we're going to be really close to uh, running out of drink. We're going to have to do something to supply our drink. Likewise, you know, this seems like a lot of fish at first, but you'll go through it pretty quickly. And we'll need to think about food and drink before the first caravan arrives, because we didn't bring a surplus. Make sure I got everything set in here. Yep, looks good. And at long last, we unpause the game and we are now playing. Our dwarves will immediately spring into action, constructing the carpenter's workshop, the work, the metalsmith's forge, and the smelter that we designated. In fact, they finished with the carpenter's workshop already. And if I query it, I can add jobs to that workshop. In particular, we will be adding. Uh, we will be adding training axes, wooden training axes. I'll actually make ten of them. Although I only have four dwarves who are going to use them, I want to have a small surplus available when I have migrants in case I want to cut additional trees. Dwarves who are assigned the carpentry labor will immediately take jobs in the carpentry workshop, and you can see here this first job is active. I could cancel it, in which case this job would be aborted and its items would be suitable for somebody to come and pick up and deliver to a stockpile, and he'd start on the next job. And dwarves will basically run down through the jobs individually, one at a time, bang, 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 all the way to the end until they've finished. So if you want a job to be done over and over again indefinitely, you can put it on repeat. That job will be done as long as there are materials to do it. For right now, we want these ten training axes and nothing else. Now, our metalsmith's forge is up, but we don't have any actual metal bars to make tools with yet, so this isn't doing us any good just yet. We'll need it in a moment. Our mason over there is finishing up the smelter, and now that it's done, we can actually make bronze. Now, there's this particular order to this, and here's how it goes. The first thing you always do is you always make the bra or the coke, and you put it on repeat. Next thing you do is you make the bronze bars from ore, and you put that on repeat. And what will happen is we'll use up the unit of charcoal, making coal into coke, and then from then on we'll be able to use the coke to power the bronze reaction. So first we'll make coke, then we'll make bronze, then we'll make coke, then we'll make bronze, then we'll make coke, then we'll make bronze, and so on and so forth. Until we run out of coal and run out of copper and tin. Now, notice our miner, our first miner here, picked up the first training axe that was done, and he's off to cut this tree. And when he cuts it, there'll be a giant spill of logs. Well, that wasn't as giant as I was thinking, but there you go.
comparatively it is because trees in version 31 only gave you and version 34 only gave you one log each and those stupid badgers wandered in a little too close and got the business end of our dogs that scattering you just saw around our wagon is the effect of the discipline skill so all of our animals scattered when the ban badgers came in a couple of dogs held their morale and actually attacked the badger and that corpse in the middle surrounded by blood is the badger sow that they killed um, notice this brackets around it that's the forbid logo so this is a forbidden badger sow corpse this is a permitted badger sow corpse if an item is permitted your dwarves may touch it if it is forbidden they will pretend it does not exist they will walk around it over and never look at it it really doesn't matter in this case and as the animals regain their morale they'll start to come back so there come our draft animals and the sheep scattered and so forth And at this point, all of our miners are cutting trees, and we'll have all our trees cut here momentarily. Notice our smelter is still running. Our mason has gone on to doing the furnace operating jobs we assigned him. And we should now have, let's use the T key here. With the T key, we can see inside that workshop to see that there are coke and bronze bars. And coke and bronze bars are required for the next step, which is to build picks. So we'll add weapons, picks count as weapons, bronze, and we'll do bronze picks. And we'll make ten of them. Even though we don't need ten because we only have four guys that are going to do mining right now, we might need extras later, and there you go. And our metalsmith slash grower will come along to start making picks. Our miners have finished cutting all the trees in the area, uh, completely denaturing the forest, if you will. That's a fair number of logs. In a heavily wooded area, if I cut this same number of logs, I would have enough logs to probably keep me for 10 years if I wasn't using wood to power my smelters. Yes, this is an enormous amount of wood compared to version 34 and version 11. The tree change is significant. Um, in version 4004, just as a trial balloon when I was looking at stability che checking it, um, I uh, embarked in a heavily forested area and cut the trees in an area roughly this size and I built like a three-story tower out of wood just right out of Embark basically. Uh, it's now possible thanks to the amount of wood you get to build a wooden palisade fairly early on if you want. So for those of you who are having to deal with evil terrain that's something you might be wanting to look into. Okay, at the top right you'll see an idler count. That's how many idle dwarves are not doing jobs of any sort in the fortress. Right now we have five of them. If I hit U to get into the units menu, this will tell me all about all the different things on my map. So, for example, there are two badgers who have died. And this will track everything that dies in my fort or goes missing. These are the wild animals and invaders who have come to pay us a visit. There's a common snapping turtle, a great horned owl, and so forth. Pets and livestock that are belong that belong to my dwarves. Notice they're all tame. It, it indicates the status of their taming, and the citizens. And here I have five idlers: one, two, three, four, five. Four of which are the miners who don't have a job because they don't have any picks yet, and one is the carpenter because he's actually finished making all the axes we asked of him. Now, generally speaking, early on you want to keep your idler count low as possible. It's because you want to maximize the amount of labor your dwarves are actually doing. Your dwarf labor, your dwarf time. Your man hours, if you will, is the primary limitation on your dwarves to start. Now, initially, I want to make a few things here. I want to make a few extra buckets because we want to make sure we have something to transport fluids. I want to make cages for transporting animals. I want to make beds, and I'll put that job on repeat because we're going to need a lot of them. I'll need bins, and we'll put that job on repeat because we're going to need a lot of them. And we're going to need a few other things, but for right now, that'll do. Um, somebody was asking about wheelbarrows at Embark, and... We could go straight into wheelbarrows right here by making logs into wheelbarrows. It's a whole lot easier to just make them than to bring them. You save yourself a ton of embark points. Finished goods like mine carts and wood and wheelbarrows, even when they're made out of wood, are extremely expensive. Hey, 
and the badgers are coming in again. Notice that we made a masterwork bronze pick. If I'd brought a pick, it would simply be normal already. By bringing the bronze and smelting it down for ourselves and building it up into tools, we've already come out ahead of what we would have if we brought that same material. Let alone the ben additional benefit we get from uh, getting more out of them. Yeah, we'll check and see if we've actually got our picks. Yep, we've got enough picks to start our mining now. So we'll pause the game here because I want to look at what we're actually doing. And the first thing we'll do is we'll dig a downward staircase and we'll put it right here. Oh, about here ought to do. Nope, not right there. Right here. And then I'll go down into the earth, digging an up-down staircase. On all the levels down below that, I think by then we should hit a cave, because I don't think I actually changed my Z levels in this fort. So our fort is going to be much shallower and much broader than we usually are. It's not going to be nearly as efficient as normal. Now notice, I've designated that, but nobody's doing it. That's because we don't have the lever, or the uh, labor assigned. So we need to go back over to Dwarf Therapist. Make all of our miners back into miners. And when we go over back over to Dwarf Fortress and pause it, they'll pick up their picks and get started. And they'll actually mine out down through the earth here. Soil layers, sand, some type of clay probably. And two layers later we hit stone. And we'll get a few layers of stone. I don't think we turned up the Z levels to what I would normally do, so the fortress is going to be a little squashed. This will definitely hit the caverns at some point. Well, almost definitely. We're basically going to touch the caverns early and then seal them back up so that nothing comes in. At least in theory. And there we hit the caverns. Okay, so now we will clear out all of these orders. Replace them with up staircases. And then we will get rid of all of these up staircases that had go both ways because we want to seal that back up so nothing comes in from below. We'll designate those for removal and then we'll designate them for channeling, which will punch them out as a whole, basically. Basically, we're going to rework the bottom of our staircase into a dead end so that nothing comes up from the caverns to get into our fortress. Very carefully, we will excavate the edges away from our staircases. Notice that the staircase going up allows our dwarves to get back out once they're in. You want to make sure you don't strand your miners. There's actually a name for that in Dwarf Fortress. If you strand all of your miners with picks and they die somewhere where you can't retrieve them, it's called Digger Mortis. With all the staircases removed, we can now build staircases to replace them. We'll build up staircases in this case. Span that out a little bit, and we'll build it here. That's build construction up staircase. Looks like granite is the closest thing. We'll just make them out of granite. And we'll put the granite in place, and that will give us a staircase. Somebody will come along here momentarily and build those for us. And now that those are done, we can do the others. We'll come back to the caverns later when we're ready to actually start doing something with them. 
but this gives us an advantage for later, and I'll show you as soon as I'm sure that this has been built here. I want to make sure that somebody does actually build our floor. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take all those miners that people have been asking why so many, and we're going to actually dig out the surface area, uh, subsurface area here. And I'm going to dig several floors subsurface out. And that's three floors, 22 or 21 on a side square, which is a reasonably fairly sized area. Uh, we'll use this first one for pasture space, probably, or surface crops. We'll use the second one for food collection and so forth. And we'll basically... If you build uh, upstairs on top of an up on top of a down staircase, I believe it replaces it with an up down. And I'm not sure you can replace up downs with ups. Our dwarves will come along, dwarves have a tendency to start at the lowest level, so he'll start in this soil level, and they'll clear this out. Now this is part of the reason why I use so many miners, is because I'm going to excavate a fairly sizable space fairly early on, and I want to make sure that I get it done quickly. And to do that, I need miners. I've even temporarily arranged, for example, I have an idler right now, let's see what who it is. And if it's somebody who's doing this job we don't really care about at the moment, uh, in this case, it's my planter. I don't have any more tools for him to make that I care about, although we're going to. And I don't have any farms for him to plant, so theoretically I could temporarily make him a miner. However, what I'm really going to do is go up here and have him make trap components for us. And before we make trap components, let's make some other items we're going to need. Let's make some war hammers. We'll make ten of those. That'll give our military something to use. I do not yet have a link because we literally created it from nothing on camera. I will save it out and I will post it, but I will not have it right now. Your best bet will be to go back out to the subreddit thread where I advertised and I will post it there. Now we're going to put our farms right here. I'm going to put them... Now... Farming, I need to give a bit of discussion here, too. I'm embarking in an area with soil. If you have soil, then you can build your farms right on the soil. Nothing is necessary. Farm on soil equals immediately usable. If, however, I were digging this out in a stone layer, like, say, down here, stone requires irrigation at least once. You have to run water across the stone in order to create mud, and once you've got mud, then you can farm on stone. Soil is ready immediately. So, soil is useful if you plan to do farming fairly early, and we do. Notice our idler count is running zero. That means every dwarf in our fortress is doing something. Uh, the miners are digging, the carpenter is carpentering, and on and on and on. Once we've got those ten war hammers done, our, we'll want our farmer to come down here and get these uh, farm plots built so that nothing grows up under them. Miners do not necessarily stick to one floor, so they've already started on this floor in addition to the others. There is a new version of Dwarf Therapist. It comes in the starter pack. Download the starter pack today. Go starter pack or go home.
Ah, oh, that's not dug out yet. There we go. Our dwarves are kind of bouncing back and forth, cutting out terrain as they go. Here we go. And these are fairly large farms. These will produce all of crops we will ever need for our fortress, pretty much. Uh, they are sizable uh, farm plots. Now we're going to build a series of stockpiles, P, here in the middle, uh, for food, F. And we're going to dig one that covers the center, one that covers two squares around the center, and one that goes around all of that. And what we're going to set these to do is, when I query the stockpiles, I'm going to change the settings on this one to block everything with B, and permit all plants. And I do not want barrels eventually, but I'll take them for now. And we'll change the settings on this stockpile to be seeds only. And we'll allow that one to have its barrels, but we'll have it take only from links. We'll have it take from this outer stockpile here. Outer stockpile will be seeds as well, all types, but we will disable all barrels. And the reason we're doing this is very simple. This chained stockpile setup right here is going to prevent us from having a spam warning that we get from farming. What happens is someone will create a seed in your fortress. Somebody will eat a plant that has a seed, for example, and someone will grab a barrel, and go for the seed. But the problem is, is the barrel that they're carrying has all the seeds in your fortress in it. Which means while that barrel is on walkabout, nobody can plant squat. By doing it this way, dwarves will pick up the loose seeds and deliver them to the outer stockpile, and then move them from the outer stockpile into a barrel in the inner stockpile. The seeds will be contained in a very small, tight, compact space, but you won't get all the planting warnings that you actually have if things are going missing. Potash farming is back in, but you don't have to have potash. If you have your farms requesting it, that's because you've actually hit the button on one of your seasonal or fertilize options. So if I query my farm plots here... Um, It's going to ask what I want to do with each one. So down here at the bottom is a list of the seasons and whether I'm fertilizing or not. And if I hit F, it's going to say I want that fertilized. And if it's on fertilized or it's on seasonal fertilized, then your farms will come back and demand potash. They'll cancel a job for fertilization if they don't have it. Fertilization is not required. Your farmer, especially once he hits a high skill level, We'll be able to plant enough crops in those squares right there with no fertilization or additional inputs necessary to drown your fortress in plants. I can show you workflow, but not now. DF Hack hasn't updated and workflow isn't ready yet, so we're not even using DF Hack yet. Okay, now the way I set my crops up are I'll have one I'll have one farm plot producing nothing but plump helmets. And the reason is because plump helmets are, as I said earlier, an absolute staple crop. I'll have one farm plot that's producing quarry bushes in all three seasons where it can produce quarry bushes, and dimple cups in the last. And I'll have a combination of sweet pods and pigtails on the others. Where possible, the sweet pods will actually give way to the pigtails, because pigtails are more important to my fortress than sweet pods are. And the off-seasons will be dimple cups for both. I have to wait for my farmer to actually get this last plot built here. And as you can see, the dwarves are delivering the seeds in the order we asked them to. They're delivering them first to the outer stockpile, and then picking them up and moving them to the inner stockpile. 
that minimizes the amount of time your barrels go on walkabout, maximizes the amount of time seeds are available for planting. And already our farmer has left his metalsmithing job and started in on planting our crops. And in this case, I believe he started in on sweet pods because we're in spring still. So he'll plant all our sweet pods and then he'll plant, uh, he'll go around and he'll plant each farm plot one at a time. And that takes care of farming, basically. We've got our farm set up. Uh, we'll need to have, and I'll let this, there we go. And now we'll put a stockpile up that covers this entire floor. And this is going to be our primary food stockpile. And so we'll go into settings, and I didn't set it up for food in advance, so we'll disable animal, we'll enable food. Now there are certain types of food we don't want in this stockpile. We don't want unprepared fish. We don't want seeds. We already created a stockpile for those. And we don't want prepared food because that will go to someplace else. Uh, extracts. We want to make sure that animal extracts are off because we don't want milk drawn all the way into the stockpile. We want it used up. And lye will have its own stockpile as well. So miscellaneous liquids are turned off. Everything else can go ahead in the stockpile for now. Later on we'll move drinks to their own stockpile as well. But for now we've got enough space. We might as well just move them here and we'll move them again later. It's no big deal. Can I do up a post with this setup for seeds or like a YouTube? I'm not sure I understand the question. The reason I do vertical down into the earth rather than spreading out over one Z level is that dwarves use the same amount of time to move up and down that they do left and right. So the further your fortress spreads out across broadly in one Z level, the less efficient it becomes. When you stack your fortress like this, everything is close to everything else, which minimizes the amount of time your dwarves spend traveling. Oh, the seed transfer stockpile system? Oh yeah, stock... Google, uh, you probably can find it on Google now. Google Dwarf Fortress Stockpile Logistics 101 Reddit. And I'll bet you probably find it. Let me see. And the first link comes up to this post. Stockpile Logistics 101. And this is where I posted the exact reason why I'm doing my stockpiles this way. Right there. That's all there is to it. Dwarf Fortress Stockpile Logistics Reddit 101. Done. Oh, did I put it up? Did somebody put it up on the wiki? I couldn't remember if I did or not. That's great. So if it's on the wiki, that's perfect. Now everybody can just go out to the wiki and look at seeds. There you go, guys. This, the reason this is necessary is because there's been a change in how things are hauled to a stockpile. Basically, in the old game, Dwarves would take things to the barrels, and that was great. worked perfect. The problem is in the new version, they use the barrels to pick up more than one item at a time, so they'll go to the stockpile, pick up a barrel, come back, and pick up ten different plants. The problem is, is if there's only one plant on the ground, they go to the stockpile, pick up the barrel, come back, pick up the one plant, go back to the stockpile, drop the barrel off, then go back to what they were doing. But that's two extra trips they didn't need to make for just one item. By setting up a chain of stockpiles with a stockpile give that takes no barrels giving to a stockpile that does, you combine the benefits of being able to store everything in barrels and condense the storage, as well as being able to minimize the number of hauling trips. Now there is a slight downside. If you've got ten plants on the surface, you're going to have ten haulers working with them instead of having one guy grab one barrel and pick up all ten. Alright, so that takes care of 
where we're producing our crops. Now remember we had plants in this stockpile, but I don't actually want to store my plants here. This is just a temporary feeder stockpile. This stockpile is going to give to the main food stockpile. So plants will be stored here because it's closer. Then they'll be moved to the main food stockpile when there's space. Item blocking site means you have an item on that area and you're trying to build. Use K to look at the items on the area. So I can hit K and I can see that right here, for example, there's sand cavern floor in my stockpile and nothing else. If I was trying to build a wall here, it would say, no, you can't do it because there's a stockpile. Oh, I see. You guys are talking about the most annoying game error messages. Yeah, the cannot plant seeds because Urish McCaller is moving every every seed in the fortress is a really annoying error message. This top floor here, right underneath the surface, for, eventually will become surface farms where we'll actually grow un, grow surface crops underground because we're that awesome. But for now, we'll use it for pasture space. Um, we'll move into we'll move into surface farming much much later. We don't need it right away. You'll notice that some of our dwarves have already started to fall asleep. You can see our miners are zing right there. We need to go downstairs. We need to get some space dug out. Now, let's see if I got quick fort blueprints for this. Alt-H will allow me to unhide my tooltips here. And then Alt-F to pick a blueprint. And we'll pick out the circle 15 space and hit OK. Now we're ready for playback and we can use Alt V if we were curious to see where this will intersect with everything. So that's the footprint. Oh, it starts with the northwest. I don't want to start with the northwest. Well, I need to measure this one. So let's talk about what it would need to do this manually. So here's me digging out the circle manually that I'm going to use quick port for. And there's a circle. QuickFort allows me to do this via a blueprint. And as you can see, it's designating that same area. So let's turn this off temporarily. Let's dig here for a moment so I have a marker. And then we'll turn off all of the digging we've done. And then I'll tell QuickFort to designate that for us. And then presto, QuickFort added it. And I go down a floor and I hit again and QuickFort did another one and I go down again and I can do another one and we can do this over and over again. QuickFort will basically let me do every floor in the entire fortress at the press of a button, nice, neat, pretty circles all the way down. I don't actually want to dig all of that out yet, so for right now I'm going to actually cut it off. I'll get rid of the wall designation here so the dwarves have no way into that space. But this first one will leave, and our dwarves will immediately cut out a circular space for our fortress. And we're done. We've designated circles for every floor in our fort. Now, I don't actually want circles on every floor, so I'm going to go up a couple floors below the bottom, and we'll go into here, and I'll cancel all of this. Because we're in a kind of a vertically shrunk fortress, I'm going to use a larger bedroom blueprint than we normally would. Let's see, I want to get a new sheet. I want to go into the blueprints folder. I want to get a bedrooms folder. And I want to get a big bedroom 
Uh, three housing by marble dice. That's the one we use. And it, and it shows me kind of what the blueprint will look like. And I hit OK. And then I hit Alt-D. And it designates it for me. Presto. Bedrooms. And then I go back and cut it off because I don't want the dwarves to actually dig it out yet. Now what we'll basically do is, as we expand, we'll simply open up a wing. And QuickFort uses CSV files. Basically, if you look inside one of these blueprints, uh, these are all CSVs. Okay, not that one. Each of those D's stands for dig, and each of those periods stands for do nothing, and this basically digs out the area that it says. It does not dig automatically the center area, but my staircase was there. You'll notice that it tells you, hey, this starts at the 31 by 31 location, which just happens to be right in the middle of the blueprint. So you put the middle on your middle and hit the button, and away you go. Bang. Done. There is an enormous variation of blueprints out here. I encourage you to explore them. Uh, special shout-outs for Jerf here, who has some fractal designs for some of his fortress that he's contributed. Jerf was the one who originally recommended circles that I stuck with, so I use circles for most of my floors. But for bedrooms, pretty is good. And it's a couple of button presses, and that would take me a long time to designate manual. But in a nutshell, that's quick for That's all there is to it. So now we're going to dig out a space, and we'll use this as hospital. And then the floor below this we'll do as dining room. As you can see, we're still keeping our dwarves completely busy. Everybody's got something to do. We are running at absolute maximum labor capacity. Someone asks, why circles? And the answer is geometry. Moving on a diagonal takes 1.4 times as long as moving directly north, south, east, west. Which means every space in my circle is the same distance from the center staircase. If this were a square, so for example, if I went down here, and I dug, dug, dug the same floor out as a square, I'm basically encouraging a trade-off. So there's the square, okay, those points. You'll notice that that means we would have more space, and that's true, you would. But each of those corners is further away from the center staircase than the areas in the circle. And, although it looks momentarily like this square where the X is, is the same distance from the center staircase as this one. This one is actually 1.4 times as far because of moving diagonals. Which means this square and this square have the same travel time. This result is given by a squared plus b squared equals c squared, for those of you who recognize. Planting continues apace. 
And you can see that because we breached the caverns early, we've already started to get plant growth. Here are some plump helmets, wild plump helmets, just growing. I can have someone pick them if I want and supplement my crops that way. The fungus that's growing, the stuff that looks all this blue and yellow colored stuff over here, can actually be used to feed our sheep. We will u actually use that. We will station our sheep in underground where they are safe. And we have an idler. Who is idle? Our mason is idle. We don't have a job for him just yet, so let's see. What can we have him do? He can pick up a pick and start digging. That's what he can do. I don't have anything else for him. So temporarily we go up to five miners. Now this space will actually be for our hospital, so we'll build beds here. And we'll go ahead and build all the beds that we need for our hospital. Looks like we're one bed short of the pattern we had. Now this will double as a dormitory until the bedrooms are ready. So this will be where our dwarves are sleeping. We'll hit R to query that, hit R to make it a room, we'll expand it until it fills the available space. We'll make this into a dormitory, and we'll name it Hospital Dorm. Now our dwarves will come here to sleep if they don't have a bedroom, which is basically all our dwarves at this point, because we haven't dug bedrooms. If we hit Shift-R to get to the rooms menu, you can see that we have some decent quarters with no owner. That's our Hospital Dorm. So this gives our dwarves the ability to sleep in a decent bedroom, without actually having one assigned. It's not as good as having their own private bedroom, it's better than sleeping on a cave floor. Two floors down from the dining room, we're going to put in our stone working area. And we'll just use whatever stone is on hand. Moving boulders is slower than using blocks, and at this point we now have a job for our mason to do, so he's now leaving the ranks of the miners again. He'll drop his pick right where he left it, and he'll get to work on masonry. Interesting that he canceled the job for losing the pick, and not because he was no longer told to. Very interesting.
Okay, that gives us stoneworking, farming, and we'll also double up and do booze and such on this floor. So now let's get rid of some space. Now we've created all those stockpiles, you know, but now we can actually go back and remove some of the things we put in. And that takes care of pretty much everything we need for food production except milling. And eventually I'll add milling in here by adding some querns. Now we're going to put our mason to work pretty much full time. We're going to have him cranking out stone furniture for our dining room and for our eventual bedrooms. Uh, tables and thrones are chairs and tables for our dining room. Cabinets and coffers are containers for our dwarven bedrooms. Blocks are used for constructions. And by doing all of these things, he's going to gain skill. Now we're going to use a little trick. If you hit N and go into the Nobles menu, and go down to Manager and hit Enter, we're going to make our furnace operator into a manager. And we're really only doing this because we want access to workshop profiles. We're not actually going to have a manager actually doing anything as a manager right now. It just gives us access to profiles. We're going to go into the profile and we'll set our profile up just a little bit here. In order to use this workshop, a dwarf must have at least skill level 5. So this means Right now, even if I had multiple dwarves all doing masonry, only those who were of a certain skill level would actually be able to do these particular jobs. Someone rightly pointed out that in my flurry of building construction, I did forget to actually do kitchens. And we'll need a stockpile. Remember, we're going to set our main food stockpile to only take from the other stockpiles. So we'll make sure we have a stockpile to take from our butcher's workshop. Because that's going to take all of our meat and our fat up and give it back to main stockpile, which only takes from links. We're going to want another smaller stockpile for barrels. And this stockpile will basically be just to keep barrels on hand and convenient for our brewers. Barrels and large pots can both be used for brewing. So that stockpile will take all of our spare barrels and have them on hand for our brewers. I don't need the second butcher. The only purpose for the second butcher is uh, overflow. If I start to butcher a lot of animals, it helps to have a second butcher to pick up some of the slack. 
I won't actually have uh, a skilled butcher, probably. I'll just spread the jobs out a little bit. Our miners need something to do, which is why the idle count went up. Let's go downstairs and look here. We got our dormitory done. We need to do dining room there. This is for prepared food and drinks. We'll cut that out now. And then we'll do some more industry down here. That'll give our miners something to do. Since when? I haven't seen any signs on the degradation of wine in pots versus barrels. It is now summer. Dwarves would drink window cleaner if it had booze in it. This is not a happy-go-lucky dwarven summer camp. This is a dwarven fortress. You'll drink what I give you and you'll like it. Ah, our first invader. No doubt a kobold. Paradexes is hidden. Oh no, I have funk focus lost there. So right there is a kobold thief. And in fact there are two of them, and they are both fleeing. Probably got horrified by actually seeing somebody. Alright. It's got our miners doing their thing. Good good. Now, after we've got these floors dug out, then I'm going to have to turn my attention to something else. We don't have a we don't have a steady water supply secure, so that's the next thing we're going to do is we're going to deal with a water supply. But it is ten o'clock. This is the time when I said I would knock off for the night. So I will post the uh, next stream advertisement out on the uh, subreddit, just like the one I did for tonight, and we'll pick up right here where we left off next episode. Before I go, does anybody have any questions? You've been sitting on this entire time, even though you should have asked them before now. Anything at all. Knock yourselves out. Probably will be streaming again Wednesday. Um, possibly tomorrow, but I can't promise that. The subreddit, for those of you not already familiar. That's the one. You'll see an advertisement very much like this one.
if you have questions about the stream, if you're watching after the fact, this is where I would post them to. Tonight's episode will go up on YouTube at some point, and it will be available on Twitch in my previously recorded stuff for a week or so. I've been playing since uh, 2010's version. I don't know, version 3107, I think. I don't go back as far as the 2D. I will also, in this week, or in tonight's advertisement, I will post the World Gen Seed and other information once I'm ready. In the launcher, you can change your key bindings. That's what you'll need to do. You'll need to go into the launcher and change them. Yeah, we will definitely, we will definitely, once DF Hack updates, be covering workflow as well as a number of the other plugins, assuming they're updated in a reasonably timely fashion. No, I didn't. Version 40 beat you to the punch. Don't worry, though. We're going to do another get Glacier Embark in version 40, and we'll, do, we'll get to the Lawn Wang then for sure. Waste not, want not. Yeah, I do these periodically. Um, it's been a while since I did the last one, simply by virtue of 3411 being so stable. Generally speaking, I'll run one for a few years, Dwarf Fortress years, mind you, uh, while I demonstrate it on film for people to watch. Once you get a fortress three, four years in, unless you're doing something crazy you're pretty well solid. There's, You're not going to lose the fort at that point unless you do something silly. Yeah, see, I like the look of that, man, but it kills me to maximize my travel time that way. Well, I mean, like I said, if you want to, if you want to drop the drawbridge and send your ten dwarf army out to meet seventy goblins coming the other direction, that's you know. Yeah, see, I don't normally run my fortresses that long. I'll run them out, you know, thirty years and call it a day. Now with the new version, I may, I may conceivably run fortresses out longer because I know I can retire them. Now, I will want to get um, World Gen Seed up, as well as some other things, so bear with me, and I'll, our advertisement out here will get updated so that you can actually copy my uh, World Gen Seed. I'll include my Embark profile, and it'll also include the uh, custom prof professions I use for Dwarf Therapist. So it'll pretty well run the gamut of things you uh, you need to play the same way I am.
No questions before I go. All these viewers and no questions. Hey, anytime, man. Um, I know this was pretty basic tonight. When we start getting into the next things, we're going to cover water pressure, we're going to cover uh, security design, but uh, there's only so much of this I can do in a given sitting. So when we come back, you got to figure we're going to do wells, we're going to have to get a metal industry set up, we're going to have to uh, blue. We're going to have to get our military set up and assigned. Yeah, it'll pick up a little bit. We'll start covering a little more advanced topics tonight. Like I said, because we're starting off with literally set up and. <laughs> Advanced world gen. By the time I've covered all that kind of stuff, that's a lot of lot of material to run through. Siege engines are a mixed bag. Um, ballistas work really well if you can line your targets up. Catapults are basically stone movers and not much else. We will actually engineer a complex entrance which will employ siege engines. And we'll use traps as well. Uh, we will probably touch on mine carts, and we're starting to get kind of fuzzy because it depends on how long I stream, what days I stream, and so forth. We will probably touch on mine carts for use in quantum stockpiles third or fourth episode when we start talking about moving stone around. Uh, mine carts in terms of actually using them to transport things... I find them kind of iffy in general. We're going to have to set up in this fortress because of the way it's designed a uh, an actual minecart route to bring ore to the base of the world for smelting and then to uh, bring the items basically back up. Now, when we use the minecarts, they will be perfectly safe. But primarily, I find the use of minecarts is pretty well limited to quantum stockpiles, and that's about it. I know folks use them for, for minecart shotguns, but meh. No, the, the best use of a minecart is by far the quantum stockpile. We'll actually use it to store stone in one square right next to our mason's workshop, right next to our mechanics workshop, right next to our... Uh, rock pot crafting workshop. And hopefully by the time we get to our second or third episode we'll start to see uh, necromancers. Uh, we will have a garbage stockpile inside where nothing can get to it to resurrect anything. Uh, you can throw your refuse into magma and it will be incinerated. You can dump your refuse under a drawbridge and crush it. Frankly, necromancers just aren't that much of a threat, and that's assuming that they are fixed in the current version and not still bugged to be afraid of their own zombies.
Generally speaking, I deal with necromancers using a combination of traps and military. Necromancers will come in two general modes. They'll either try to besiege you with an absolute ton of undead, or they'll try to slip in unseen and ambush your dwarves by uh, resurrecting your uh, refuse pile, for example. Yeah, see, the, the different towers are now different factions, whereas I, before I think they were just one. And if it wasn't fixed, necromancy, if you visited a necromancer's tower in the adventure mode, basically the necromancers would be cowering in fear from their own zombies. Tile sets are primarily a matter of choice. Everybody's going to have their own opinion. I like Phoebus. You'll see me use it. I don't recommend the ASCII, personally, because I found it harder to get a hold of. Uh, truthfully, I can't predict my schedule enough in the evenings to be able to do so. If I have to work late, it becomes very difficult to stream, so I generally know about Oh, call it eight hours in advance, and I'll post a post an advertisement and go to town. I don't have a set stream schedule. See, and I've tried ASCII, but frankly, I get the characters switched in my head. It doesn't help. See, I think in, in the modern era, see, I, I understand all those folks who come from NetHack and Rogue and, you know, who are used to using ASCII, basically, to play their games. That's, that's you know, a point of pride, and I don't mean to denigrate that at all, but I would say that, for me, personally, tile set first. Um, slap Phoebus or Space Fox or Obsidian or whoever, throw it on there and let them go. If somebody wants to go back and actually learn the vanilla game so that they can be able to play before the tile sets are updated, well, they can put the extra effort in at that point. See, it, it, people who get used to it, they love it. They, they, they're they quite happy with the ASCII, and more power to them. But I'm thinking that if the changes that are coming with tile sets being able to represent uh, objects with different tiles come to pass, there's actually going to be an advantage.